Just how does a college student deal with his younger sister being killed in a mass shooting? What if your understanding of the world was different from that of the narratives prominently featured in mainstream media today? And just how are mass shootings politicized in the eyes of 22-year-old school safety advocate Hunter Pollack? This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kelleck. On February 14, 2018, Hunter Pollock's life irrevocably changed. He had just passed his math test with flying colors, with his sister Meadows' support and encouragement. But that day, a gunman opened fire at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, and killed 17 people, including Meadow. Hearing about the shooting, their father Andrew started searching for information about Meadow. In a photo, he happened to be wearing a Trump 2020 t-shirt that day and the picture spread throughout the internet. In the days that followed the shooting, Meadows' family, instead of getting support, was relentlessly attacked for their political views. Today, Hunter has moved from being just another college student to becoming a vocal activist for school safety while completing his undergraduate studies at Florida State University. Hunter Pollack, very good to have you on American Thought Leaders. Pleasure to be here. So, you know, we're here obviously in the aftermath of the El Paso and the Dayton shootings. Um, You yourself lost your sister Meadow in the Parkland shootings a year ago. Um, What went through your mind when you found out about these these horrific uh, killings? That they were highly preventable. Like Parkland, the Dayton shooter was a walking red flag. He brought a rape list to school, a kill list to school. For a long time, they knew he was a threat, yet no one stopped him. And then I thought, okay, well, the El Paso shooting might be a different situation. But then you heard that the mother warned the police that her son was a threat and he had a gun, but no one did anything. Like I said, we could talk background checks all we want, but if the police departments aren't doing the job they should be doing and mental health institutions aren't labeling these people as psychopaths, then the law will never work, no matter how many changes you make to it. So, you know, this obviously harks back, as you suggest, to to Parkland and uh, and this whole issue of uh, the shooter getting all sorts of passes, even though they were clear, clear problems. Um, Where where do you feel the system fails from what you've learned since then? The the big thing in Parkland was these Obama-era leniency policies that want to eliminate the school-to-prison pipeline pretty much make it so minority students aren't in in trouble anymore, getting in trouble. While doing that, the school boards that implement these policies are collecting these huge federal grants from the federal government. Meanwhile, they put students like my sister in danger by having psychopaths in her class. So they're just taking advantage of these horrible policies like the superintendent in Parkland, the sheriff, they signed this agreement. We exposed it in our book coming out, um, Why Meadow Died the peoples and policies that created the Parkland shooter and endanger America's students. It really goes into detail about these Obama era leniency policies that are in schools in Detroit, Chicago, Baltimore, New York, and Broward. So actually, yeah, we're we're planning to have your your father, uh, uh, Andrew, on the show when when the book does come out. I'm very, very curious to learn what what you've discovered since, since Parkland. But so can you uh, break down for me, not maybe for our audience, um, how, how does this, how do these leniency policies work exactly in your view? And what is, what are, what are they trying to address and what are they failing to address? So they want to stop the school to prison pipeline, like I mentioned, keep minority students out of jail. They want to eliminate suspension, give kids multiple chances to get in trouble and never discipline them. Well, the Parkland shooter, for example, He had dealt with the police 45 times, yet he was still able to buy a firearm because these leniency policies say, hey, we can't arrest him. We'd rather collect money from the federal government and then waste it. So with the Parkland shooter, we just found out these policies were so bad, instead of actually suspending him, he got frisked every day before he walked into school. They patted him down for weapons and they said he can't bring a backpack to school. That's a threat. That kid should never be in a public school, yet they still had him come every day. So our book exposes all these failures. Parkland was the most preventable mass shooting of all time. And then you see El Paso and Dayton were super preventable, a lot of red flags. 
And I think to myself, you could just sit there and be sad, you could cry, you could call for gun control, which is very easy to do, or you could get up, be a man, look at all the failures, look at the facts, hold people accountable, and actually make a positive change and end these mass shootings. You know, you actually, I'm going to read a tweet that you uh, posted uh, recently. Um, and because I, I do think that, you know, this is a still fairly fresh, fairly recent. And it, I, I think as you allude here, you wrote, I guarantee that there are other siblings like me who can't process it yet, but will be enraged that the media and politicians seem to care less about finding, finding out the facts uh, than using a tragedy to attack President Trump. And I just want to expand on it. I, I expect, of course, siblings and anyone who's close, that is going to be the rawest wound. But I expect, you know, all, all local people will be shocked and horrified when these things happen. Of course. So tell me a little bit about this politicization that you're talking about in this tweet. I, I remember the first few days after Parkland, just laying in bed, depressed. My sister just passed away. Watching the TV, we had a group of kids on CNN from morning to night, simply just bashing our president. Then we had that town hall where Dana Lash and Sheriff Israel debated, and everyone booed Dana Lash when she was just clearly stating the facts. And that's when it was time for me to speak up. So I began investigating, seeking answers and accountability for what happened, why it happened, and what we could do to fix it. Well, for doing that, I got called an NRA shill. It, it just simply showed that the left attacks anyone who doesn't believe gun control is the problem. You're like a threat to them, and that's why I tweeted that, because like the Dayton and El Paso shooting being recent, Parkland was recent, and I was depressed. I had no clue, but as I got more vocal, I became enraged with the media that they used these children to bash President Trump instead of investigate the facts. The media is an enabler in these mass shootings, and I, I'm going to keep sp speaking out and exposing them, and I, I can't be silenced. So yeah, you, you also wrote, this is another tweet that I noticed, you know, I'm tired of seeing CNN lie about how President Trump reacted to mass shootings. He's the most empathetic person I've met since I lost my sister in Parkland. So tell me more. The day of the shooting, my dad was frantically looking for my little sister searching hospital to hospital to see if somehow she had arrived there. She was in the emergency room getting surgery. Well, he had a Trump shirt on, and he, there's a famous picture that went viral of my dad holding up a, a picture of my sister on his phone. The media took the picture with his Trump shirt on, and we got attacked like you never could believe. Your, people wrote him, your daughter deserved this because you support Trump and the NRA. I mean, thousands of messages just attacking my dad about his political views. So, of course, the president was well aware of that, and he invited us to the White House the next week. We sat in the Oval Office for 45 minutes. We talked about what happened and how we can fix it. And the president was the most empathetic person you'll ever meet. I remember him actually listening to my father and I and then pointing to Hope Hicks at the time and saying, I like that. And it was about the School Safety Commission. And the president, he's a man of his word. He developed the commission. A few months later, my dad got invited back to the White House, and the most comprehensive school safety report out of any president was developed. The president is a true man of his word. I mean, the compassion he showed us was just really heartfelt, and I, I can't thank President Trump. I couldn't imagine any other president being in the White House at the time because nothing would have got done. If you look at Sandy Hook with President Obama, he had the chance to really change the gun laws, something the left advocates for, but he did absolutely nothing. Thank God for President Trump. Changing gun laws, what, what kind of change would, would you advocate for? Really, just changing the age we did in Florida, which was acceptable. I'm not a fan of red flag laws. I think they're unconstitutional. And then the left wants to talk about background checks, well, why didn't the Dayton shooter and the Parkland shooter have a background? They were obviously psychopathic criminals, multiple run-ins with police. They were, threat, they were threats at school, both schools, the Dayton and Parkland. Kids were scared to show up to class. Why didn't they have a background check? If the left wants to talk about background checks, we need to actually hold these psychopathic criminals accountable and give them backgrounds. So that's my message before I talk about any gun control. Let's fix these institutions that aren't doing their jobs. It's not that the law isn't working, it's that people are failing. 
So basically, the, it's the enforcement of the laws, in your mm -hmm. view, that that is the Failing. immediate thing that could be that could mm -hmm. be corrected. So, so how do you do? You have a sense of how that could be done, for example, with respect to uh, background checks. Mm -hmm. We just need to make sure that if these agencies aren't doing their job, we hold them accountable. In Florida, we did that. We worked okay. with Governor Ron DeSantis to suspend Sheriff Scott Israel because he had policies that enabled the Parkland shooter. And then we worked with Governor Ron DeSantis to launch a grand jury investigation against the school board for misspending or failing to spend safety money and enabling these promise program policies. And we've been very successful in the grand jury. It's stuff I can't talk about, but eventually you'll see that the school board and the sheriff will both be held accountable farther than we already have done. But can the lessons from Parkland, from the, this, the grand jury work that you know, can they be applied um, across the board uh, or to other <laughs> counties, to other places in America? And also, and, and if, if so, how quickly can that be done, given that you can't mm. talk about it? Well, I could talk about the school safety report we did with the president and then the Senate bill we passed in Florida. They're just recommendations. These school boards still aren't following the recommendations. With Senate Bill 7026 in the State House, we passed that teachers can be armed. But Broward County doesn't have to arm their teachers because it's just a recommendation. Right. I mean, we could keep recommending things, but it's up to the local school boards to actually follow through, which is why I encourage parents to always follow up, make sure they're voting the right school board members in, look at how their superintendents uh, following safety guidelines, and be well aware of what the sheriff's office is doing because we didn't do that. And that resulted in my sister passing away. I don't take blame for that, but I wish I was more proactive than reactive. The idea of arming teachers is a very, very provocative to, to mm -hmm. many Americans. Um, tell me more about how that works and why you think that makes sense. I think we need armed personnel at schools, at churches, at malls, especially our schools though. Teachers should be armed and security personnel should be armed based on the fact that these mass shooters are cowards. If they, if they know someone's going to fire back, they won't show up to the site. If you look at the Parkland shooter, he had ample amount of time. I think it was anywhere from 8 to 11 minutes, which a three-minute difference is large, but still 8 to 11 minutes. Inside the school, no one shot back. The coward our SRO hid behind a concrete wall outside, and he was able to shoot 34 people. If one teacher were armed, he would have shot, they would have shot back. The killer would have dropped his gun and ran. He had no experience with that rifle. He was a blatantly a coward. And I just think if we arm teachers, it would serve as a deterrent and it would serve as a first line of defense for these students. So basically, I mean, the, the, the argument is simply when you have places where it, there can't be any weapons, those are the places that the psychopaths will target because they know that they can do it with, without, without any resistance. Mm -hmm. Is that the idea? Uh, it is the idea. These, these shooters are cowards. They're going to these soft targets because they know it's a free-for-all. They could kill as many people as they'd like, and no one will shoot back. If you look at these shooters, too, they're seeking notoriety. The more people they kill, the more of a celebrity they are because the media will cover them more. So the Parkland shooter kills 17 people. He's the biggest celebrity in the entire world at the moment. The media constantly covers him. They show his face. They say his name. They give him the satisfaction he's seeking. Then the El Paso goes and kills 22 people. The El Paso killer kills 22 people, and he's a bigger celebrity. The, the fact of the matter is if we could shoot back, these people wouldn't be able to get those astonishing numbers, and they wouldn't be the celebrities they want to be. And I, I think I noticed, I don't know if it was you, but, or, uh, but I saw that there was a, a front page that was posted. Maybe you'd be posted, but then you kind of blurred yeah, out the... Post blurred out the, the front page. You, were, you weren't very happy about that. No, I mean, no notoriety is a big issue. It's a, a campaign I fully believe in. The president believes in it, and all the other Parkland parents believe in it. We need to stop making these killers famous, or they'll completely stop doing it. Before, eight, we call him 181958, my sister's killer, because we refuse to say his name. Before he went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, he took a selfie video saying, the whole world will know who I am after this. And what does the media do? They plaster that out for other killers to see. He sets the blueprint for more psychopaths that they could become famous. So when I saw that on the NY Post, I said, what the heck? You're literally making this guy a celebrity. Everyone in the world's going to see him with his gun on the front page of a newspaper. 
and people are going to think he's famous now. He's a celebrity. He's like LeBron James or Colin Kaepernick in status in our country, and people are acceptable of that, and I'm not. So I fully believe in no notoriety. So basically, like others might feel like, hey, I want to be famous too, so this is how I'm going to get my <laughs> This is fame. how I'm going to get famous. Uh, these are isolated young men who don't have a lot of friends, and they want to feel important in society. So, you know, this is actually interesting. Many of the mass shooters, uh, when we look back, uh, are actually young men. Mm -hmm. you know, what, what, what do you make of that? Why, why is it young men? Do you, have, you, have you looked at this at all? I know. The, most mass shooters, I think the last female in a mass shooting was San Bernardino when they killed, I think, 14 people in California. We need to ask ourselves, why are young men so angry? Why are they dropping out of society? A lot of these young men are fatherless. They come from broken homes. When they were young, they went through physical or emotional abuse. Maybe their parents commit suicide or a bad divorce. We really need to study these facts and see what we could do to help young men. I myself, I try to serve as a role model in everyone's life I can. I'm always talking to younger men in a sense that if you need help with school, work, discipline, I'm there for you. My phone's constantly blown up from people. I try to help as many people as I can. I serve as like a therapist at okay. home. And um, I think that we also have a lot of social pressure with like apps like Instagram where everyone wants to be like LeBron James who I referenced earlier and all these celebrities it's just not realistic we should be respecting our everyday father we should be respecting our troops our first responders and our blue-collar workers and society lacks that they they think it's cool to be a single parent they idolize rappers now I just think that we need to change society as a whole we need to bring God back in the schools. There's a lack of religion going on. No one has faith anymore. Everyone's so angry. One thing that I, another thing that I saw that you tweeted, I'm just kind of, you know, following, trying to pick up on some of your, your perspectives here, um, was a tweet from uh, uh, Martin Luther King's niece, Alvida King. Mm -hmm. right? and she was, she mentions, uh, um, Listen to my words, President Trump is not a racist, and this is in response to all sorts of accusations of racism, and even, you know, the president isn't welcome in El Paso, th this kind of realm of things. Why, why did you choose to tweet that? Because the left throws the word racism around like it has no meaning. Racism is a horrible word. It shouldn't be used unless there's actual real racism going on. But now the left's using it to pander to the minority audience and make them mad at the right. I believe the president is far from racist. Black unemployment's at an all-time low. Hispanic unemployment's at an all-time low. He passed great criminal justice reform. So how is he a racist? So I retweeted that because Martin Luther King is someone we all look up to. Right. He sparked a real change in our country. If his niece is saying that, she deserves to be listened to, and I had to retweet her on my platform. So is this a, an extension of this politicization that you're kind of rallying against? Yes. Or? I think that these politically incorrect or politically correct policies are, are ruining our country day by day. Since Parkland, um, you know, you've become a, a kind of school safety activist, I guess you would say. Before that, um, were, what were you doing before that? I was just a normal college student living a great life with not a worry in the world. But I just, this is my clearest memory of the shooting and I'm bringing this up because I want to say the type of little sister I had. February 14th was my first math test at Florida State University. My sister was on to me. She was like, you better be studying all night. You better get an A. So two hours before the shooting, she texted me, good luck on your math test. I went in, I got an A, I did really good. I came out to the, there were shots fired. I was devastated, I texted her only what's up, thinking she would respond, never heard from her again. But because of her, I got an A on that test, so I thank her forever, but she was just a great role model to me, even though she was younger. I, I looked up to her work ethic, I worked up, looked up to how much she loved animals, how caring she was, how she took care of my mom, and I, I truly miss her, but I say with my sister in my heart, there's no one who could stop me. And there's been a lot of trial and tribulations, like not being able to speak at the march, losing a school board election, being attacked by 
every single figurehead in Broward County and now the country as we get bigger and bigger. Well, so let, let's talk about a bit of this this activism. Um, you know, for example, these scored school board elections that were held, uh, you know, in late 2018. Yes. What, what happened? We ran a school board candidate, Richard Mendelson, a great friend of ours, and then a father of one of the victims, Ryan Petty, ran. We lost both races, but while running them, we were attacked by the Broward Teachers Union. We were attacked by other politicians. I'll never forget, it was raining. And the union picked up Ryan Petty's yard signs and put it over their head as umbrellas. I said, his daughter died and you're using his sign as an umbrella? I mean, they labeled me everything in the book. They said I sexually harassed teachers, I was violent at the polls. I mean, they slandered my name completely and I wasn't the person running. They didn't attack my dad, they didn't attack, for some reason they kept attacking me. And it just really showed how dirty unions are. And we ended up losing it, but it was the best lesson of my life. I mean, I have not learned from my winning. I've learned from failing. And my message to younger men is when they fail, that really, that's really the best learning lesson. You could learn a lot from your failures, and I did from the school board race. But so with the school board race, um, just for, for the benefit of our audiences and so forth, so you, what, what were you advocating for that, that the union was fighting so hard against? To fire the superintendent, to increase teacher pay. Th those were the two main things. And to get rid of the Promise Program, which they believe right. is something that works really well. I'll tell you a story about how well the Promise Program worked. The sheriff's son, Brett, sexually harassed a special needs student, a 14-year-old, and wasn't even suspended, I th or if he was suspended, it was a day. That's what the Promise Program did to Broward. You could sexually harass students, but you won't be held accountable. Wow. And that's something the union really believes in. Well, just a few weeks ago, the union president went to the school board and said, my teachers are being physically assaulted, and the students doing so are not even being suspended. So now, from day one, we were right. The teachers union is complaining about teachers getting attacked and no one being held accountable. So it's just good to see that we were right, but we lost that and we're going to win in the future. Sorry, who is, can you repeat that? Who is complaining? About the, the union teachers president okay. of the teachers about union. About the teachers being attacked. Mm -hmm. The teachers are being attacked in Broward County schools. They're scared to go to school now because they're worried they're going to get assaulted. Because there's no consequences for the There's no for consequences the for the students. I see. Wow. Why do you think you lost? We ran a Republican in a Democratic district, and they couldn't look past that. When you're running school board races, it shouldn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican. It should matter who's best interested in making it a better school district. But Democrats refuse to look at facts. They just look at party line. And we could have really made a positive change in Broward County. But because we're Republicans, they refuse to allow us that opportunity. So what about this uh, March for Our Lives? Um, you know, I remember seeing seeing a few headlines about that back mm -hmm. in the day. Um, tell me a little bit about what happened, you know, kind of the process of getting of there. Yeah. I wanted to speak at the march. I thought it would be a great way to honor my sister in front of millions of people who were watching. When I attempted to speak, they said I wasn't allowed to. And they waited until the day before to tell me. And as time went on, I, I thought, wow, this isn't about the victims and their families. This is about pushing a radical agenda, which is banned guns. If they really cared about the children who were dying, they would have let the brother of a victim speak, and they refused to. It just showed the, the cruelness that comes from the left. So you think you were just denied mainly because of your, your position mm -hmm. on the gun on issue? Guns. They asked to see my speech. I sent it to them. They read over it and emailed me back. I won't be able to speak. I see. And so, and, but subsequently, it seems like you got more opportunities to speak, right? Because I of did this, get more right? opportunities to speak, but mm -hmm. I've never had the opportunity to go on CNN or any mainstream media outlets and explain myself. The only news outlets that's covering me is Fox. And now I thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my story. I appreciate you, you taking the time. Especially. So these days, when something like this does happen, again, you know, Dayton, El Paso, so you're immediately thinking, okay, policy and so forth. Or is there still emotion there for you? There's, there's no emotion. I'm completely emotionless to this. I'm just tired. I'm fed up. I think if we really got together in the Senate and Congress, we could pass legislation that'll benefit, you know, benefit these mass shootings and stop them.
So tell me a little bit about why you're against uh, red flag laws. You said that. I think they're unconstitutional. If you don't have the same viewpoint as someone on Facebook, what do they do? They report you. They block you. Well, the same thing would happen in the real world. If someone doesn't like you or, or quote unquote, thinks you're sick, they're going to call the police on you. Your firearms are going to be taken away, which is unconstitutional. And then you won't have the, the right to defend yourself in court for a while. So pretty much, I think it's unconstitutional and it violates our Second Amendment rights. I mean, so basically you're saying that people could use these things for dis political disagreement as opposed yes. to actual mental health. We're giving the government more access and Trump may not be president in a few years and the laws are going to get much more strict. I would never want to damage a law-abiding citizen's right to protect himself. Any, any final thoughts you might have? There's a stigma that mental health is a bad thing, that if you're mentally ill, you're necessarily going to be violent. I think that we need to give these kids the resources they need so that they don't feel pressured to stay silent and we can really help this world emotionally and socially. So this is actually quite fascinating. You think that people are um, hiding the fact that they have mental illness because of us, the social stigma. Yes. And so letting, basically creating an environment where people can just say, look, I've got some issues and yes. let, me, let me seek help. That, that could make a difference. Yes, I mean, people are being attacked for feeling like they're mentally ill, depression, anxiety, all those things are embarrassing to people who suffer with those problems. And we need to make it so people aren't as scared to come out I think we need to be more empathetic and reach out to our friends and family and see how we could help them emotionally. And the world, if you just reach out to one person, you could really save a life. And so you think this is individual by individual, but you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of policy or legislation. What, what kind of policy or legislation could help with this? We need to put social workers in schools, real professionals, guidance counselors nowadays absolutely help no one. We need to put social workers in school and give children the opportunity to talk to someone when they're emotionally hurting. People who can actually kind of People who can diagnose, actually or... diagnose these students and keep what they're saying confidential and make sure that when a student goes to a mental health or we could say a social worker at a school, that what they're saying won't be released to the public or that the school won't use that to damage them. I saw in, in the University of Georgia now that at orientation they're requiring all new incoming freshmen speak to a mental health specialist. Well, I ask myself, are these professionals they're speaking to? Are they going to keep it confidential? If they say they're suffering with this problem, will the school use that and against them to hurt them moving forward academically. So there's a lot of problems. And I think that we need to get all the experts, sit at a round table, a bipartisan round table. It's imperative we listen to each other and we offer the best solutions. And the president and Senate, Senator Mitch McConnell work off of that. So in your mind, mental health, not guns, are the actual big issue here. Mental health is the big issue with social pressures and lack of resources. Young men are hurting and dropping out of society, whether they're committing suicide or committing suicide and killing multiple people. If we could tackle the issue of mental health, we could end these mass shootings. We need to make sure that everyone is empathetic for other people instead of judging someone for being depressed or having anxiety. So tell me a little more about why you think a universal background check wouldn't work. How are background checks going to work if these criminals don't have backgrounds? They'll pass no matter what. We're not holding them accountable when they're young, meaning they're going to pass the background checks anyways. I emphasize, it's not that the law isn't working, it's that people are failing. Okay, that, that's extremely interesting. So on one hand, uh, I just want you to reconcile something for me here. On one hand, um, you're saying that it's very important for there to be a history, a background, so to speak, so that a background check actually will be effective. On the other hand, if I heard you right, you're saying that we should have uh, confidentiality when people talk about mental health issues and so forth. I just want to make sure you can reconcile both of those for the audience. Well, there's a difference between violent mental illness and nonviolent mental illness. And there's a lot of violence going on with our youth. And as they grow older, they're not being held accountable, thus giving them no background check. So they'll pass any background check, no matter how strict they are. When I say that nonviolent students and their mental health records should be confidential, I truly believe that because I don't want them for speaking about how they're hurting inside to be damaged in the future for just simply uh, seeking help. 
So, and then someone that, you know, early on, let's say in their the process of their mental illness would be able to basically find the help so they don't, so it doesn't escalate to this kind of, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, horrific levels that we've seen. That's, is that the perspective? Exactly. And, and if we have to Baker Act someone, we should, because then that would stop them from buying a firearm. If someone gets Baker Acted, they're clearly mentally unstable and trying to hurt themselves or others. But if they're not Baker Acted and they get the help they need, they shouldn't have to pay the consequences for seeking help. What, what is Baker Acted? I'm sorry, I don't it's know. It's like that. a three day, you go to a mental health facility for three days and they do evaluations on you and have physicians and psychiatrists coming in and eval evaluate you to make sure that you're ready to go back out into the real world. Hunter Pollock, thank you so much for taking the time. Of course, thank you for having me.